Okay, um, hi everyone. That's it. I think we're ready to go. So today we're going to continue talking about the Thunderbirds, and more specifically, we're going to talk about the Dromornithids. And I mentioned to you yesterday that I began working on these, on these big birds from Australia. And I'm going to give you a little bit about a background about these birds and how I got involved in them. So this one is more directly related to my research. Okay? Yesterday's one was basically just an introduction to the big birds. So this is just to remind you, these were these very large birds. In fact, we now think that they were the biggest birds that ever lived, even bigger than the elephant bird from Madagascar. And in, um, how can I say this? Until recently, it was debated whether the Dromornithids, this particular one, Dromornus turtini, was the largest, or whether Apionus was the largest, the one from Madagascar. But it turns out, when we've done now the weight estimates of these birds, it looks certainly like Dromornus sturtini, this particular Dromornithid, was the largest. And so what we're interested in is to try and understand the biology of these birds. So I told you yesterday that there's um, many different kinds of these Dromornithids. We find them in the fossil record from about 8 million years ago. And one particular species of this Romornithids is called Genionus. It's very easy to remember because it's named after my colleague's wife, Jenny. So it's Genionus, Jenny's, uh, Jenny's bird. And Genionus is the most recent of the Dromornithids. And this particular one is one of the older ones that we find in the fossil record. This is Dromornus. So we find many, many bones of this. Those shelves are all filled with fossils. And I mentioned yesterday that all these bones come from a central locality um, called Alcuta in the heart of Australia and in the Northern Territory. And this museum where all these bones are kept is in Alice Springs. And so we basically went to Alice Springs and we looked at these bones, uh, studied them, sorted them out. And this particular person is uh, Warren Handley, and he was the main person who was doing the um, anatomical studies of these bones. So um, Trevor, I think I have another picture with everybody labeled. Um, Trevor and I were basically supervising the re research that he was doing. So the point about the study began initially just by looking at the bones themselves. Okay? So Warren decided that he would want to study these birds and try and understand something about um, their biology. So what, when he began looking at them, he used these methods, which were basically is a simple comparative morphology. So just comparing the bones with one another and comparing them with other bird taxa that we know of as well. So making this kind of comparison between the different birds. He then used the um, skeletal elements that were there to estimate how heavy these birds were. And he then did what, something that we call landmark geometric morphometrics. So in the first case, when you just compare bones, you're really relying on your own subjectivity. You're basically looking at this bone and you say, this one is bigger, this one is smaller. You're looking at this. But when you do geometric morphology, what you actually do is you identify particular parts on the bones and you do this comparison with those landmarks to other parts of another bone. So you have a very good idea about the shape. It's more an analysis of shape. And this geometric morphometrics is a wonderful, wonderful method that many biologists are using. You can use it on modern animals, fossil animals, anything that you want to actually describe its shape and compare its shape. So we increasingly use geometric morphometrics. And what he found was that in that large sample of Dromornus, there was clearly two different morphs. There were two different types. That they were one species, 
but there seem to have been a larger variety and a smaller variety. And the larger variety was a lot more robust, so more kind of rough, the bones had more, um, um, what can I say, rugose uh, attachment sites for muscles. It was altogether just bigger, but the overall uh, shape of the bones were the same. And he then determined that Dromornus was actually sexually dimorphic. This means that the males and females of the species are very distinctive. And we see the distinctiveness in terms of their body size. Now we know many animals in the animal kingdom have the sexual dimorphism. Actually, humans are sexually dimorphic. I mean, men tend to be bigger than women. The bones tend to be more bigger. And also the, the actual uh, shape of the bones in terms of the um, gracility. So whether they, how robust or how gracile they are, you can generally work out when you're dealing with a male or female human. And in much the same way with these birds, they looked clearly like there was two different morphs. And of course, in modern day, if you're looking at modern birds, it's very easy to identify males and females because the males tend to be more brightly colored and they tend to have a lot more uh, differences in terms of plumage, they vocal, they sing. You can see them. In the fossil record, it's so much more difficult to understand whether you're dealing with males or females. But according to the study that, um, that uh, Warren did, he was able to separate out Romanus <coughs> into two different morphs, and he was able to show that the males were the larger morph of this particular species. And he worked out also the size of these birds. So using, again, the measurements of the tibiotarsus, so the leg bones, he used the, the, the lower part of the bone, the, the tibiotarsus and the femur, and both bones showed that these morphs were different, and the female's average body weight was about 451 kilograms, and the male's average body weight was about 528 kilograms. And the upper limit was about 610 kilograms. So the, amongst that sample, there were some that were really large and they were about 610 kilograms, so quite a big difference in body size. So at this point, Warren actually wondered, is there another way that he can test this hypothesis that Dromornus was sexually dimorphic? And then when he spoke to me, I said, well, you know, I look at bone microstructure, and I am sure that from the bones themselves, we would be able to say something. And yesterday, John Rogers asked me a question about the kinds of bone tissues. And what I have next is just a little bit of background to explain something about bone tissues. Because you know, if I just talk about it, it's a bit difficult for you to understand. So I thought, let me put some pictures that more clearly show these bone tissues. So what you see here is a fossil bone, in fact, you must believe me, this bone is 180 million years old. It's a dinosaur bone. And this bone is not stained with any particular color. The color that you see in that bone is its natural coloration. So what we do here is we take a fossil bone and we make a very, very thin um, slice of the bone. So we take a piece of the bone and we grind it down until you can actually hold it up to the light and look through it. And that section we look at, at under the microscope. And this actually is a slide from a dinosaur from South Africa called Syntarsis. And what is quite astounding here is that you can see all these structures that are present in our bones as well. They're exactly the same structures. So when an animal dies, okay, all the organic tissue, the soft tissue, the flesh, the blood, all that decomposes. And in the end, all you're left with are bones, and the teeth, of course, which we generally call the hard parts of the skeleton. And the reason why bones and teeth survive is because they have an inorganic part to them. 
So all our bones, the, the way our bones are structured is, be, is, that, is, is that they have both an organic component and an inorganic component. So all the organics decompose. The inorganic part comprises of a mineral called hydroxyapatite. It's the same thing that makes our teeth hard. If you, if you knock your teeth, it's the same, it's hard. And what gives that hardness is the appetite, the, this hydroxyapatite. So when all the soft tissue decomposes, that mineral gets preserved. And what is amazing is that in living organisms, that mineral is so closely associated with the organic parts that even though the organic parts decomposes, the mineral structure is preserved. So what we have here is the, the, the mineral organization of the bone. The different colors you're seeing, that blue and the red and the um, yellowy color, is actually the different orientation of the mineral crystals in that bone. And the way it organizes depends on how fast the animal is growing. So yesterday, I told you about endotherms and ectotherms, and they have different growth rates. And we can see this in the fossil record because we have a direct way to measure it. We can actually see how fast this bone was actually formed. So in this case, in this dinosaur, we can see the bone was formed very, very quickly because this different organization of the um, hydroxyapatite tells us this. Each of these little black spots that you see, that's what we call the lacuni, and it's in all our bones. The bone cells occupy those spaces. So in a fossil organism, the bone cells have decomposed, but the cavities have become infilled, and that's what's preserved there. And in much the same way, these larger lumen that you see here, these big ones, these are the channels through which blood vessels and nerves course through the bone. And just like in the dinosaur, our bones have the same. So the, the blood vessels and nerves have decomposed, those empty spaces then become occupied by minerals from the environment. So sometimes you can find beautiful, beautiful dinosaur bones, which already looks quite pretty here, but sometimes you can find other kinds of minerals that occupy those poor spaces. So wherever there's a space, you can sometimes find minerals growing. So you can get quartz in them, you can get calcite in them, and they sometimes look really quite spectacular. But my interest in bone microstructure is that you can use this bone to now understand aspects of the biology of the animal. So by looking at the bone tissues, you can look at the rate at which the bone is forming. So as I told you, in this case, we know the bone is forming very rapidly as compared to a tissue where everything is organized and all those colors are the same because they're growing quite slowly. We can also understand whether we're dealing with juveniles or adults, because the bones of young animals are different from the bones of older animals. So very clearly, we can see ontogenetic differences. And we can also understand something about growth dynamics. So if we have many individuals of the same species, so if you have young individuals, you have um, sub-adult individuals, and you have older individuals, you can actually understand something about how that animal is actually growing through its life. So you can understand growth dynamics of that species. From the bone tissues, we're also able to deduce when that particular species attained sexual maturity. And this is clearly evident in the bones because when organisms are young, they grow very quickly. Once they attain sexual maturity, they put energy into reproduction and not into growth. And that again manifests in the bone. So very clearly, we can say when organisms actually attained sexual maturity. And again, if we are biologists looking at modern populations, that's easy to understand. But in the fossil record, it's a lot more difficult. 
But having bone tissues, we can actually make those kind of deductions for those extinct animals. Other interesting things that you can deduce from bone is you can understand something about how the bone is structured to support its lifestyle. So if you have an animal that is terrestrial, it means it has to support its own body weight. And the bones are designed, I'm not sure there are any engineers here, but the bones themselves are actually designed to cope with that body weight. And what's fascinating, you know, yesterday I told you about the big giant um, Quetzalcoatlus, the big birds, and I, I, I had the privilege to work on some pterosaurs from Argentina, and they were not as big as Quetzalcoatlus, but they were still extremely big, and they had the most thinnest bones I ever, ever saw. So if we think about birds having light bones, the pterosaurs have extremely light bones, to be able to fly, but like we have bridges when you have those arches that come up and you have those supporting struts that support the bridge, in the bones of the pterosaur, you find that they are these struts that develop in the bones to strengthen the bone walls. So extremely thin bone walls, like about a millimeter in thickness, and they have these struts that strengthen them. So we can you make deductions about how the bones are structured for that particular lifestyle. In the large birds that we study, we won't find light birds. They, they don't need to be light because they don't need to be airborne. So in the case of our large birds, they have thick bones like most other terrestrial animals. We can also, from bone, we can make deductions about disease, and I've worked on a number of different um, animals where we find diseases in the fossil record. In fact, just uh, beginning of last year, I published a paper on a titanosaur. Okay, so that tells you what a big dinosaur it is. It's called a titanosaur, very, very large, from Argentina. And this animal had three bones in its skeleton that clearly showed pathological features. And so we described that. I've also worked on uh, dinosaurs, the stegosaur, you know the dinosaurs which have the big plates on their back? And we have examples of a di dinosaurs from a particular part of North America where they have also pathological features. So it's so clear in the fossil bones. When you find normal tissue, you can actually see this, but very, very often, you will find that if you have very old dinosaurs, you can see clearly they, they have osteoporosis or they have arthritis or spondylus. They clearly show pathological features in them as well. And it's absolutely fascinating to see this. Sometimes we can actually see, like my student is working on a dinosaur from South Africa, and we can see there's a pathological growth in the bone, and then it recovers. The animal actually recovers, and it's normal. It grows again normally. And so it's quite nice, because we, we can say that that animal lived much longer even after it had that incident. So it's, it's quite cool to have that. Sometimes we can't say whether the animal died because of the, of the pathology, but we can clearly see that there was some kind of trauma to the bone, and we can see that whether there was a recovery, how much of recovery afterwards occurred, or in some cases, it just becomes even more, um, the animal and the bone becomes even more and more riddled. You can see the, the way the, where the infection started and then how it actually spread in the bone. So it's really wonderful. So bones really are fascinating. They tell us so much of information about prehistoric animals. And I must say, you know, uh, somebody asked me yesterday, how did I get into paleontology? And it's really because I was studying zoology. So I'm, my background is zoology. I'm a zoologist. But when I discovered that you can actually look at bones and you can make such wonderful deductions about animals that we know nothing about, I, I was really quite taken by this. And since then, I've been involved in a number of different animals, and I just enjoy what I do. I really love it because each animal 
a fossil that we find, to find the fossil is quite wonderful. But then to be able to flesh it out and say something about its biology is really so exciting. And I really love that. So I've worked a lot on dinosaurs. And in fact, in 2005, I published my first academic book. On, it's called Microstructure of Dinosaur Bones. So it's a much more academic text. And it's published by Johns Hopkins University Press. And this one is published more recently. It's Forerunners of Mammals, also an academic book. And this one is actually uh, published by Indiana University. And these books have really been very important for the field because at the time when I got involved in this research, it was just beginning to develop. So it was just beginning to take off. And so I literally rode that wave because my work is, in many cases, is regarded as pioneering because it was just new ground that was being broken, new areas. And today we have so many more people that are doing this kind of research. So it's fascinating to see how bone tissues and the study of bone tissues has developed over the years. So if we look at birds, coming back to our big birds, if we look at big birds and if we look at juveniles of any bird, we will see clearly there is a particular uh, kind of tissue that's formed. So the area where blood vessels and nerves go through are very large, it's these big areas. So this is a modern bird. This is actually the secretary bird. Okay? And we can see the tissue. Remember I told you about the organization of these structures? The different colors and the way they form tell us that the bone was formed very, very quickly. So here we see a juvenile, and its bone is forming much more quickly. As this bird grows up in a subadult, we see all those extra space around that becomes closed, and we see the bone becomes more um, organized and more compacted. So it doesn't have that porous or spongy structure as earlier. In an adult, we see that the bone has changed completely. The early bone that was formed when the animal was still young is this bone. And you can see, just by the organization of those osteocytes, those bone cells, you can see that this bone was formed very quickly as compared to these bones. Can you see that? It's, it's very, very clear. And this kind of triple-layered structure is what we typically find in most adult bird bones. So they grow quickly. When they reach sexual maturity, that growth rate changes, and they begin to form that bone. So this bone here is actually the bone that is formed during late stages of their life. So after they reach sexual maturity, the growth rate slows down, and they basically change the bone tissues. And we know this today because on modern birds, you can actually stain their bones and follow their life history. So we know what happens at the different times. This bone on the inside, the inner circumferential lamellae, this bone forms as, see, when the bird is growing, initially, its diameter is very small. It's maybe that size. As it's growing, the diameter of the bone has to expand. And so when that bone is growing, it actually will expand and encroach onto the bone that was formed earlier. But once it reaches the size that it needs to be, it stops um, kind of encroaching on the bone surrounding it, and it forms a ring of bone that lines the medullary cavity. It lines that central cavity. And that bone also tells us when the animal has stopped having this medullary expansion to grow, uh, to, to reach a particular size. So this is typically what we see in adult birds. But there are some exceptions. And the exceptions are interesting because we know that they tend to come from more slow-growing birds. Okay? And it really was a surprise for us to find that the kiwi, which is this little bird from New Zealand, okay, it takes nine years for this bird to reach adult body size. 
I mean, who would have thought so? It's such a little bird, you think it actually will grow very quickly. But in fact, living on the island, there's no pressure. Remember I told you yesterday that on an island, there's no pressure, if, especially if you don't have predators. In New Zealand, except for the Haast eagle, remember I told you about the big Haast eagle? There's no pressure to grow quickly. So why put energy into growing? Of course, these animals didn't know about humans arriving, but nevertheless, humans certainly have put enormous pressure on many populations that didn't know about them before. And in the same way, we see the kiwi takes that long a time. And if you make a section of a kiwi's bone, you will find growth rings. You will find, remember I told you there are lines in the bone that you can actually count to work out the age of the animal? You will find growth rings in the bone of the kiwi because it's growing so slowly. And just like in the Dionys, the moa, also we find that there's no pressure to grow very quickly. It actually has growth rings in its bone. It's growing to a larger size, but it's growing slowly. It's not growing very, very quickly like we find in a secretary bird. So the pressure to grow very quickly doesn't exist. And I've worked on uh, Garganto avis, which is a, um, also a bird found on an island, so we call them an insular bird. And it's found in the southern part of France. And at the time, seven, about 70 million years ago, that part of France was an island. And it has the most incredible fauna, because 70 million years ago, we find these large um, birds, terrestrial birds. But just earlier in the Cretaceous, we see that there were actually dinosaurs in that island that were very, very small. So they were, the, typically you'll find the big sauropod dinosaurs, but on this island, those sauropod dinosaurs were dwarfs. So it's really incredible. Yesterday I told you about the island rule, and that really applied to those big sauropod dinosaurs. And we had these birds that became very big as well. And so we were able to work on this uh, Gaganto avis, and we also found that they took a long time to reach adult body size. Now, I told you some of the things that can be deduced generally from vertebrate bones. And in the case of birds, we can do a little bit more than the usual. So, when birds actually molt, when they shed their feathers, especially if they have catastrophic molt, okay, we find that, I don't know if, if how many of you are ornithologists here and have studied birds or look at birds, but when you look at birds that are molting, like penguins, they look so pathetic when they're molting because they just stand around, they look miserable, they actually lose body weight. They really do look quite miserable. And in fact, their bones show this. We find that in the bones of molting birds, they will develop these large cavities. And those cavities actually tell us that the demand for calcium is so high that this bird actually is not getting enough from its diet, it's taking it from its bones. Because to grow the feathers, they also need calcium. And in the fossil record, we also have this wonderful example of a penguin from the Eocene that actually shows these large um, cavities, and we've been able to say that that was a molting penguin. Something else that we can also do from the bones of birds is we can actually deduce females. So we can understand when we're dealing with female birds if we get them at the right time. And by this I mean when birds ovulate, when female birds ovulate, okay, they actually deposit a very particular bone tissue inside their bones. So if this is the bone wall, if this is a long bone, this is a cross section so sliced in that direction, and we find that at a high magnification, this is this tissue. During ovulation, 
they form this bone inside their medullary cavities. When the bone, where, sorry, when the, just before the egg is laid, the egg has to have calcium covering the egg to form the eggshell. So, because bird bones are thin-walled, they can't actually take the calcium from their bones because their bones will be too brittle and make them fragile. They wouldn't be biomechanically sound. So what they do is they use that extra calcium that they need from this bone that they lay down during ovulation. And that bone that's formed inside the cavities of their bones are called medullary bone. And so medullary bone is then used, this medullary bone is then used to form the eggshell of those birds. And I was studying a, a Cretaceous bird, Confucius Ornus, from China. Somebody asked me about Chinese birds yesterday. Yeah, you did? Yeah. And I was working on Confucius Ornus from China, and we had a huge sample of these birds. And I was able to, again, just by chance, identify the females of the species by finding medullary bone in their bones. And once we got that, we were able to then separate out the males from the females in that particular species. Because the cool thing about Confucius Ornus, and I don't have all the slides here of Confucius Ornus, but there is, in that deposit, there is two types of birds, two varieties. And just like in modern birds, one variety had long tail feathers, and we always thought that those, those were the males. And when I did the analysis, the one that actually had these medullary bone tissues was actually the one without those long tail feathers. So we very clearly were able to say for sure that these are the males and these are the females of that particular species. So identifying medullary bone is really important. And when we, oh, that's the three of us actually involved in the study, so that's Warren, and Trevor, and this was actually in Alice Springs last year. So when we actually look at these birds, these uh, dromornithids, here's an ostrich, and that's a dromornithid. So, and there's Trevor. So Trevor is very tall. He is about 1.8 meters. And you can see this is actually a very, very large bird. And when we look at the skeletons of these birds, I told you that Warren had found out that they were two different morphs. And he wanted to now understand if there was another way for us to confirm whether or not we had males and females. And in the fossil record, we have these little baby bones, little tiny individuals, and the adults. I mean, look at this bird. It's a really large bird. And so one of the things that I'm still doing and working with them on is the ontogeny of these birds. So we're working out how long they took to grow up. But last year already, we worked out something about um, males and females. So we only looked at the adults. And so we looked at all these bones, and we selected the samples. And because these bones were very big, they don't even fit in the regular machine that I work with. And so we had to take samples of these bones. And we took a little biopsy of these specimens. So we basically drilled into the specimen and took a little core of bone. So you can see this part of the machine. It's about one centimeter diameter. So one centimeter diameter out of the bone. And then we prepared the thin section. So that's the hole in the bone now. <laughs> there you go. So we took the whole, uh, that bone out of there, and we then studied the actual microstructure of these bones. And we were very lucky that the bone tissue was well preserved. Some of them, the bone tissue is completely altered, and I haven't even told you about times when bones don't preserve. So most of the time, you would get good fossil preservation. But sometimes, the bones don't always preserve very well, and then we lose that. But in this case, majority of the bones were actually well preserved. And we were able to study them. And just as a hint about the ontogeny, you can see the growth lines that are present in this bird. And so that's a study still to come. 
but we were very clearly able to identify females and males. So not all the bones, because remember, you have to be able to get a bird that is ovulating, and the chances of that is, is really is quite slim. It's, it's a chance thing, it's fortuitous. And we were very lucky that in our sample, we had four individuals, only four, that actually were ovulating when they actually died. So here you see clearly, this is a male. It's just got this a thick bone wall, a rim of bone wall. The female, on the other hand, has, that would have been the normal bone tissue, and all this extra bone is the medullary bone. And that's a high magnification of this medullary bone. So the female bone structure has this labile store that it can actually take to lay, uh, sorry, to take to make the eggshells for these large eggs that they laid. So clearly, we were able to say that the uh, Dromornis, this was actually our paper, we published this last year uh, from the journal of, it's in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, and we showed very clearly that we now had two ways in which we could identify the, that Dromornis actually was a sexually dimorphic species. We had the bone measurements that Warren had taken, and we had the histological evidence from the bones themselves. And we were able to show that males were the larger of the taxa. And another thing that we were able to say that in the sample, we had equal numbers of males and females. So there wasn't like a, um, a male that was breeding with many different females. There seemed to have been um, pair bonds between these animals because there seemed to have been equal numbers of males and females in that population. And this seems to suggest a reproductive behavior like uh, geese today, which is, again, we know from the phylogenetics that they are related to these birds. And we think that by having a big size, it may have given them some advantage in being able to better protect their young and also maybe just allow them to protect themselves from these thylacines and marsupial lions that were around at the time. So of course, Australia didn't have the mammals, the placental mammals. They had their own fauna of uh, marsupial predators. And those are the two uh, big marsupial predators that we know of from Australia present at the time as well. And I think I really fully agree with Trevor Worthy in, when he said this, that we basically to, to really understand the biology of extinct animals, we need to have more collaborative work. We need to actually bring in expertise from different people so that in the end, our understanding of the biology of the extinct animal is really enhanced because everybody contributes their little expertise, but the bigger picture is actually better told by everyone coming together. So that was my collaboration with them. And I wanted to end by just telling you that this is not the end, because I mentioned that we're still analyzing the growth series of Dromornis. So we're looking at those little bones and the bigger bones and trying to understand how long did they take to grow up. And then I'm doing some really interesting work with my postdoc called uh, Delphine Angs. She's from France. And she's actually um, somebody who did her PhD on um, giant birds from France. And she is now here with me in South Africa. And what we're doing is looking at modern birds, like the guinea fowl, because you know guinea fowls have that very interesting crest on their head. And that's the main focus of the project, her, her research. But we were so lucky that we managed to get a sample of dodo, okay? Now the dodo, as you all know, is extinct. But the dodo is a giant pigeon. I don't know if you know that. Okay, so it's just a big pigeon. It's again a giant bird because it's a, a large pigeon that became isolated on Mauritius. And because of all those reasons I told you, they actually developed a large body size in that island environment. And we were so lucky because someone had contacted 
Delphine and told her that their father, so this was an old person, but her father had been quite an adventurer in his youth, and he had been to Mauritius, and he had his own collection, personal collection of dodo bones that they want to donate to the museum. And he then gave us permission to section a sample of the bones and for the rest of the material to go into the Paris Museum. So we were absolutely thrilled because, I mean, to get dodo bones and to be able to section them and get some information about their biology is just phenomenal. And so that paper is already written up. I haven't been able to share with you that yet because it's not published yet, but very soon it should come out. And it's a fascinating, fascinating story. When it comes out, you'll hear about it. And when we talk about the histology, you also will know more about it because it, again, relies on the interpretations that I've just told you about bone tissues. OK, so it's a wonderful story, and you should look out for that. The Jenny Onus is, as I mentioned, Jenny's bird from Australia, the most recent bromornithid. And we're also working on that particular bird. It's a study that I'm involved in with Trevor, Trevor Worthy. And I have this other study that I'm working on at the moment on Apionis, which is the, the giant bird from Madagascar. So people, that's where I'm going to stop. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Yes. So we, we can say how long it took to grow, but not how long they actually live afterwards. That's difficult to say because you know we can count the growth marks. Once it reaches maturity, it stops growing. So we can't say how long it lived for after that. Yes, but that must be a certain experience. Yeah, exactly, but not everybody's been paying attention to how long it lives. So it may be 15 years, it might be 20 years, but and then living on, but exactly how old is difficult to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes? I'm sorry, I realize it's somewhat out of the field, but do you understand why there's a high concentration of marsupials in Australia? Um, yes. So, actually, uh, Eldon, can you put the light on, please? So, what, what we know, it's got to do with biogeography again and the movement of the continents. Interestingly enough, marsupials first evolved in South America, OK? And we find the marsupial fossils in South America. And we know that they tracked across from South America to Antarctica to Australia. And then, of course, all these land masses separated. And in, in South America, they were outcompeted in the great um, exchange. There's only one marsupial living in South America today. Okay? You will find fossils in Antarctica. And South America being isolated from all the placental mammals, because there were no placental mammals that arrived on, in Australia, the marsupials were able to then um, develop and basically become um, kind of the diversity that we see in placentals. So without placental mammals, those marsupials were able to develop. The other thing that you get in Australia only are the monotremes, and those are the mammals that lay eggs. So the echidna and the platypus. They are the, the very, very basal radiation of mammals. We see these um, mammals that Oh, now, how do I explain this simply? <laughs> Let me just think about this. Okay, when you remember when we talk about the the development of um, mammals from the mammal-like reptiles. Okay, so mammal-like reptiles are reptiles. We suspect that they laid eggs like reptiles, but at some point we know that in the transition from reptile to mammal, they, there was a change in their physiology, in their biology, and we know that those monotremes are early mammals. They lay eggs, but they produce milk for their young. And producing milk for the young is a mammalian trait. Okay? So they are one step above the mammal-like reptiles. Then you have the marsupials. They, they 
give birth to live young, but they have the pouch in which the young still develop until they're more mature. And then you have the placentals, which is the basically the ones where the young develop intrauterine. So it's fascinating to see that today in Australia, only, only in Australia do we have the monotremes and the marsupials. Everywhere else, they were outcompeted. And the one species is left in um, South America. Okay. Yes? Of? Yes, yes, so it's, it's, it's really interesting. Um, it's a big debate, and I'm also at the heart of the debate, because there are different things going on in dinosaurs, okay? So in 2005, there was a paper published which showed medullary bone in a T-Rex, okay? And these people said, that we have medullary bone and we clearly have female T-Rex, a female T-Rex. But at the same time, I was working on bones that came from the British Museum, and they were from uh, Transylvania in Austria, and those bones had clearly exactly the same kind of tissue inside the medullary cavity, but those bones were pathological. And I knew that they were pathological. So I wrote a paper. My paper is published 2009. So that paper came 2005. And I couldn't get my paper out. I mean, John might know how difficult it is if you say something contrary to somebody else. And I said that I doubt that that is actually medullary bone in the dinosaur, because why would a dinosaur need to form medullary bone? They have this thick, I mean, dinosaur bone has thick cortical bone like that. If they're going to lay eggs, they just take the bone from the bones. And the fact is, I have a, um, a bone from um, Austria that is clearly pathological, and it has medullary bone also. And I think what we have here is an example of a pathological reaction that makes a tissue in the medullary cavity that looks like medullary bone, but is not. And what's been fascinating is this is what I'm also doing at the moment is research in this area. I've now looked at some human bones, which form the same thing. They are pathological, and they also form this tissue inside the bone. And so I don't think that the dinosaur bone with the medullary tissue is actually medullary bone, because there's no need for them to do that. I suspect that it's got to do with the, um, with the development of the bone, a reaction to some kind of injury or, um, well, not injury, but rather infection. And the example in the, in the case of the human, it's ostitis. And ostitis, you will find in the bone surface, you'll see these bits that form in the bones. You'll see a reaction on the periosteal surface. And just this week, I prepared a section of this bone. And clearly, in the medullary cavity, there's bony growths that develop. So yeah, it's a big space that we, we're still hotly debating. Yes, so you can find, in Madagascar, you'll find the eggshells. The, the whole eggs, they seem, they've all been um, kind of so taken away. The, the eggs, no, they are. No. Well, so, certainly there are three Apionis eggs that are known, so complete eggs. One of them has actually been scanned, and there is an embryo inside. So that is clearly uh, known. And um, eggshells, people find them very, very commonly around. So basically, uh, there have been many examples. Somebody here told me that they were in Madagascar, and they saw, was it you? And people collect these eggshells, and they make a kind of, uh, a, a, a kind of how is it, a composite of an egg. It's not a real egg, but they just make up an egg from all the eggshells they find. 
So yeah, you do find eggshells very, very commonly. And the same with the genionus the, um, in Australia. And in the case of um, Dromonas, which is even older, 8 million years old, we find lots of eggshells in the sand dune environment, which again tells us that they laid the eggs in the sands, in the dune environment. So that is important also. Anything else? John. Yes, so not our bones, they, not these ones, but in Australia, we have some very beautiful opalized bones, which is completely changed, and so you wouldn't even find any bone structures in them. They, they're gorgeous opal bones. I mean, my goodness, I don't know if any of you ever shop for opal, it's very expensive, but opalized fossils, which you can get in Australia, is phenomenally expensive, so you sometimes do get them completely transformed. Okay, people, thank you very much. Wonderful. Just one minute. Did they bring notes? Did they bring some notes? Oh, the notes didn't arrive. Ah, not in the back anyway, no. Okay, they're supposed to get notes. Maybe they'll send them to you, but they were supposed to bring them. Hmm. Okay, thank you, people. Thank you very much.